The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences. These are real people sharing very real, deeply personal experiences. This content may be considered triggering for others and for those who are sharing. The chat room is a privilege intended for discussions and sharing. You are not being asked to agree, but you are being asked to stay civil and refrain from personal attacks. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Am I Mental, a live podcast where real people share stories about how mental health impacts life and how life impacts mental health. I'm your host, E, and with us tonight, we have co-host, C. Hello. And Oz. What's up, Am I Mental fam? All right, so, first things first, I want to apologize that we didn't engage with the chat room as much last week as we normally do. Last week was kind of a weird week. I was way out of sorts. You notice I skipped a disclaimer, and yeah. So, I'm sorry. However, this week we will go ahead and focus on getting that back in, on track again if we get anybody in chat, which is pretty empty right now. But I know you guys are coming. With that said, tonight we are going to be talking about addiction. Uh, and uh, Oss has actually has this unique experience of having witnessed addiction in multiple ways you know like a lot of people have the story about their addiction or a family member's addiction this is going to be much more than that so us if you want to go ahead and uh kick this off oh hey bo welcome to the chat What's up, bo? Bo. yeah i have a i i don't feel like my story is unique growing up in the inner city um it's i witnessed addiction from a young age um and it rang through in my life for i mean even till today um so one of my let me start off with my earliest memory um a lot of people's earliest memories are uh, are cute they remember fluffy the cat or fido the dog or something their mom or dad did I remember, I remember something. I remember with my mom, it was picking out the two different color of brown M and M's that they used to have. They had a light brown and a dark brown way back in the day. Interesting. I did not know that. Neither did. Well, I mean, I definitely another thing on my list of things I've forgotten. Um, so my my earliest memory, uh, my mom told me. I talked to her about it years later. Um, I was either barely out of diapers or uh, still in them. So a really, really young age, I'm sitting on the ground playing on this plush, soft brown carpet. And my mom and my dad are uh, in the dining room. It was an open floor plan. And I was on the, we, I was uh, at the top of some stairs, looking through the living room, looking at them, this long dining room table. And they're kind of arguing back and forth. And my dad's putting something on the table. And I don't remember what they're arguing about. And uh, my dad tears open a tape paper bag and he starts messing with something. And then he sneezes and the air fills with dust. And my mom completely loses her mind and starts screaming at me to get to get out of the room. Go downstairs. Go downstairs. Get out. Get the fuck out. Well, there's uh, only one I thing I could think of. <laughs> Uh, you're probably right, right? So, um, yeah, my dad was breaking down a key of cocaine. Um, he was, uh, my my dad was in, in or is, uh, he's still alive as far as I know, uh, was an interesting guy. He uh, was uh, on the top 10 wanted list uh, for the California DEA, uh, the only, uh, for a while. Um, he obviously has a record. Um, and, uh, my first, uh, experience with having any kind of addiction in my life was my dad was an alcoholic and, uh, mm. that's a really common thing for a lot of people. My mom told my dad, you know, GTFO, you don't quit drinking. So more of my earlier memories were 
Uh, my dad worked in construction uh, and uh, when he was working, um, he would take me to a bar in San Francisco called the Overflow. And the owner would see my dad walk in with me and doesn't matter. He had the biggest, baddest looking bikers on the block playing pool or whatever. He yelled at them to get the fuck off the pool table because my little butt who could barely see over the edge of the pool table would just push the balls at my hands. And every time <laughs> the balls were all gone, the bartender would stop what he was doing, tell everybody, you know, shut the fuck up. You can wait, but come over, rack the balls for me, you know, and you know, um, and my, that was my dad. Like I got into seven car accidents with my dad when I was a kid. Uh, each one of those car accidents, he had a tall can of Budweiser between his legs. Right. So my mom finally tells him, uh, she's tired of him blowing his whole check, uh, at the bars, like get out or, you know, or quit drinking or get out. So my dad quits drinking. Um, well, I think not, it, that's the right choice. Doesn't mean that right? everybody does it, but that is the right choice. Exactly. Except for <laughs> what had happened was uh, about a year later, um, another early memory was um, there was this place called the Geneva Towers in um, in San Francisco, and my dad had this old International Scout. And in those, like the early SUVs, the whole back window rolled down. Nobody cared about seatbelts. I would ride in the back and half hang out like it was a truck bed. I remember going down, uh, being in the back. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, with uh, San Francisco, uh, might be might have heard of Sunnydale uh, was one of the projects. And Geneva Towers were... Sunnydale, the, the highest building you had down there was two, maybe three stories. And then you had the Geneva Towers, which stuck up uh, like too many twin towers. Um, I mean, not 100 plus stories, but they're, they had to be over 30. Uh, and they were so notorious. Uh, the police would not go into the towers. Uh, wow. The situation down there uh, was really like New Jack City. So, And if you haven't seen New Jack City, I recommend it. I don't think it's as impactful as it used to be, but it still tells a very a very relatable story to a lot of people. Um, it, yeah. it, it's Crack's not the big drug anymore. You know, it moved to heroin and fentanyl and stuff like that, but it, it's still still relatable. It's still that kind of empire. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason I went down there with my dad is he was copping rocks. So he quit booze. Uh oh. Back then, it didn't even call crack. Um, it wasn't known as crack. What's that? Uh, I just got a notification. My internet's unstable. Sorry. Yep. I might have to log out. Yeah. Log my phone. Can you hear me okay? Or am I choppy? You were choppy, but you're clear now. Okay. Um, so he was copping rocks. Um, fast forward a little bit, like my dad, my, well, to describe my relationship with my dad, um, one, he's not my biological father. I'll save this story on how I found that out for another day, which is kind of funny. But um, not being my biological father, getting with my mother while while I was still in utero, um, for the first first five six years of my life, he went nowhere without me. I was always on his hip, always with him, always his little shadow. Like we were super close. Um, like he, I grew up going to Giants games at, at Candlestick Park and, and watching the 49ers play, um, at Candlestick Park. Uh, and it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty awesome childhood, but things started to change. Um, dad would stay out longer. Uh, don't call him dad. It feels weird. Pops is what I call him. My pops would stay out, would stay out. Uh, later and later, longer and longer, wouldn't be able to, wouldn't see him very often. Um, and then uh, one day uh, he comes, it's fourth grade, he takes me out of school early. Uh, and I'm like, are you, uh, I think I told this story uh, before um, when I was on, uh, the first time I was on the show. 
but he took me out to school early. Cliff Notes version took me to the beach, took me to the zoo. It was amazing. Got home, uh, gave my mom and mom and me a kiss on our forehead. He's like, I'll see you guys later. Took off. My mom's like, uh, what'd you think about, you know, what your dad had to say? Cause he talked to me about a bunch of stuff. And I was like, Oh, it was fresh, you know, cause that was the word of the day. And, um, and she's like, so you're okay with us getting a divorce? And I was like, what? That's how I found out that we were getting a divorce. The reason I got a divorce is my mom gave him the same ultimatum. Uh, give up the drugs or give up your family. Can't have both. So I don't see my dad for a year, fifth grade, something like that. Uh, he comes back around and uh, he comes over. My mom's not home. Uh, and so he asked if I'm, uh, he's like, you know, is your mom home? I was like, no, if you want to come in? Wow, I missed you, yada, yada, yada. All the little kid stuff. And uh, he's like, well, I was like, I was just trying to borrow some money from your mom um, and whatnot. And I had been doing extra chores and doing whatever I can, saving every penny I could to buy myself a bike. My mom, single mom, raising three kids, didn't have a whole lot of money. She couldn't just go out and buy me a bike. Like, it was a big deal. And I have been saving for a while. I was like, well, I have some money. You can borrow, borrow it. When, when can you pay it back? He's like, oh, I can get you back next week. I was like, you can borrow it. He's like, thank you so much. You know, told me he loved me. Boom, gone for another year. Right? Uh, well, that addiction. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Addiction so, makes you basically a world-class narcissist from what I've noticed. Yeah, it's the, I wouldn't even say he turned into a narcissist from like looking back and reflecting. It was, have you ever been, well, the way that I kind of understand it for him is uh, you ever touch something really hot, burns the ever living shit out of you yeah. without thinking you push it away and you pull, you pull back whatever piece appendage is being burnt right yeah you're on um, mm -hmm. 100 running on automatic um after talking to him when i got a little bit older it's kind of how it seemed to me is that he wasn't thinking and scheming and plotting how can i steal from my son he was like i am in such a way i need to not feel like this no matter what and he found an opportunity to not be hurting or going through withdrawal or whatever the hell it was he was going through um, and took it so that he could be comfortable, um, which sucks. I mean, I didn't understand as a kid, like it broke my heart. Um, and my, the, you know, spoiler alert, he's still addicted to, to crack to this day. I talked to him less than four weeks ago. Like I, I went like, I'll go like six months without talking to him, three months without talking to him, uh, here and there. And, uh, we don't ever talk on a regular basis. Um, and literally this last stretch was long enough, like five or six months. I was like, I wonder if he's dead. Started checking obituaries because I, I just didn't know. Uh, and he did the same thing that he's been doing since I was a kid. He, uh, I had, a, I had a conversation with him. I was like, don't ever ask me for money. I know, I know, I'm not going to judge you for your addiction. I was like, but I'm never going to feed it. That shit ain't happening. So uh, I was like, I'll buy you a burger. I'll buy you food. I won't buy you shit you can sell and I won't pay for your habit. So we have that understanding. Um, but he hit me up and he's like, Hey, I'm supposed to get in a truck tomorrow. Uh, he's like, if it works out, he's like, how do you feel about me coming up and visiting? I was like, that'd be awesome. You know, it's been a few years since I've seen you in person. Like, let's let's make it happen. You're always wherever I live. You're always welcome. Uh, he's like, all right, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Three or four weeks ago, right? Uh, thankfully, as an adult, I no longer get my hopes up. I know better. But hearing that same type of lie when he would call the house when I was a kid, and then it's in that moment, I believe his intentions are true. And when you're talking about that. Um... I actually got to see that conversation play out with my stepson. Even though, if you watch us interact and you see us and everything, the only way that you would ever know that he's my stepson is because 
something may come up and be like, oh yeah, no, we're not actually blood related. But he's my son. His biological father always would make plans to, hey, you know, I'm coming up this weekend from Reading, an hour drive. It's not like the biggest trip in the world. So you're like, okay, well, I'm going to be up there tomorrow. I want to see the boy, you know, see the kid. It's like, yeah, no problem. You know, we'll cancel our plans because we think it's in our son's best interest to know his biological father. Bo just said, he is your son, dude. Yeah, I know. He is my son. (laughs) Um, Anyway, I couldn't tell you how many times that we had canceled everything that we had planned and waited and waited. To never get a call, catch wind of him or anything. And then a week later, we start hearing rumors about how we hid my son away from him. Which is absolute bullshit. And then, um, not too long later, um, yeah, he, uh, we moved to San Diego. And then he called, you know, the dad. And he's like, hey, can I speak to my son? I was like, of course, you know. And he's like, I promise I'm going to call you every single day. Oh. So he was six years old when he made that promise. He's 28 now and is still waiting that call. The first follow-up call. Yeah. It's horrible. Like, yeah. Hey, any anybody who fucks over kids like that, like, I don't know. Uh I'm biased as hell, though. Like, there's a special place in hell for him. Yeah. And, you know, like, even when Sarah and I got together, because uh, Sarah has a son, we had a pretty in-depth conversation that no matter what, the kids always have to come first. You know, her her son will always come before me. Her son will always come before her. And if I ever thought that I was being put before her son, I would think less of her. You know, and she's like, well... I mean, you will never come between my, me, you know, my son and I, or, you know, I'll make sure you don't have the ability to buy, you know, right. how, a, how a parent should be. Right. And just to show, and again, I'm, I've brought this up before, but I don't know if I've told you this. Um, when my ex-wife and I, when we uh, separated and got ready for the divorce, you know, she moved to the Sacramento area two days after Christmas. She took our daughter with her, but left the son with me. And I didn't make it up to Sacramento area until April 1st. So that's how long I had him by myself. That just goes to show how much she trusted me with him. And Mm -hmm. I, in spite of everything, you know, no matter what, you know, what's fallen between us, I will always appreciate that she did that, that even in divorce that she recognized how important it was for me to be in his life. He still calls me dad. Blood doesn't make family. No. Right. And there's a huge difference between fathers and dads. Like, you know, any man with a penis <laughs> can be a father. Exactly. Exactly. Take a special kind of man, to be a dad. For sure. And you know. for some of the people out there that think that just because you have a child and you're, dating someone as a single parent they do not automatically have to accept your child as their own that's a conversation you need to have of course you also have to wonder what the intention is of somebody that doesn't want to take on the role of being a parent to your child but wants to be with you that that that's a problem yep yeah yeah, that's that's very comp. We can do a whole episode on that on that subject. Oh. It is a com- complex one, and I feel like a lot of adults try to force these uh, constructs and, and ideals on their kids on what somebody should be or symbolize to them within the family unit. My personal thought is that's wrong. What that person earns being to that child is what that person should be to that child. You know. But uh, frequency is seeing paying a bill. That does not make that does not mean shit. Other than you're helping keep somebody alive, you know. I got roommates who lose who lose their jobs, you know, and I, I pay the rent and I pay for their food. That don't make me his daddy. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, 
but yeah, and actually, to... what was funny is that um, I actually fell in love with him before I fell in love with his mom. Yeah, Jerry Maguire kidnapped the pooty. <laughs> oh my god, I gotta watch that again. It's been so long. Right. Um, let's circle stand back on to-, to addiction. Yes, there you go. Stand on topic. Um, you would. So you you can go one of generally from my experience, what I've seen, uh, you go one of two ways. Like you either become the parent, your parent, one of your parents, or a com- combination of them, or the antithesis. All right. Yeah, David's right. So it's all about how you connect with the child. That one hundred percent. You know, or even if you connect with the child, you know, it's and, some people are like, you have to call me dad because I'm the man of the house now. Get the fuck out of here with that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In some yeah. cases, that kid has been around long enough that they've already passed that halfway point before they move out. Mm-hmm. They're the man of the house. <laughs> Let's just face it. You still have to teach. You can still teach them how to be a man, but they've been around longer than you. By a lot. Oh, for sure. For and sure. and I know David. David and I, we're super tight. I, I love David a lot. Just like I love Bo a lot. They're super tight. Uh, sorry, I said, got so lucky there. Em has two really good dads. Thank you. I try to be good to him. He gets on my last damn nerve. And what I do in return is make sure I get on his last damn nerve. And we have little, little nerve itching battles. Uh, Sarah's talking about her son. <laughs> It'd be, uh, yeah, we, we go to war over it. Um, but staying on topic. Um, shit, what was the last thing I said? The ADD thing. I even took my meds today. Ooh. Oh, so either you become your parent, like your parent, or you become the antith- antithesis. Um, in a lot of ways, I became like my mom. Uh, and uh, I should... Also add that, uh, but not in this way. Um, my entire life, I don't remember seeing my mom ever even drink a single drop of alcohol. Uh, although she used to tell me how much she she liked this. Uh, <laughs> mom was a party girl when she was younger, and she she reminisced and she'd be like, "Those beautiful quaaludes." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Ma." Oh, come on. Man, that really? was the thing back in the day. Yeah. If yeah, you haven't um, seen Wolf of Wall Street, that's basically what the movie's about. <laughs> Just saying. I gotta watch it. I love me a good drug movie. Oh, uh, it's really a, hard. For- it's a <laughs> hilarious movie. Probably uh, one of Leonardo DiCaprio's best. That's a bullet statement. Here's a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. Um. So, because of my dad, I was like, I'm not doing, I, I'm not messing around with nothing. Um, and the culture was different when I was growing up. So, fast forward into high school, uh, middle school, never did anything. And my dad, growing up, would even, like, give me drinks of his beer or whatever. Um, <laughs> this is one time when I was uh, in elementary school, we were playing kickball. I lived on a super steep street. In San Francisco, we play kickball on Well, it. I mean, San Francisco, super steep street, uh, super steep street, hand in hand. This, this was steep for San Francisco standards. Like it was, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Like you, like kids running down it would go so fast that their legs couldn't keep up and they end up rolling down the hill. Like <laughs> fun stuff. Uh, kid fails. Meat but fans. I, yeah, ran up into the house, super thirsty. My dad was like watching a ball game. Uh, drinking a big old thing, apple juice. I grabbed the cup in front of him and I downed the whole thing. And he's just he's just looking at me and his smile is getting bigger and bigger. And I finished it. I was like, Ugh, that's not apple juice. And it was Budweiser. And he just laughed. He's, oh. like, he's like, go ahead and go play ball. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. I bet that kicked like a mule. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, my mom never drank, and so in the culture, I mean, I grew up in the gang culture in San Francisco, right? Um, going into high school, like, if you did anything other than smoke weed, you were basic. Like, somebody somebody 
pot, you're doing psychedelics, you get beat up because you're a bass head. You want to do hard drives, you get beat up because you're a bass head. Like, it's not like today. Like, my da- I remember my daughter coming home and saying, I don't know what to do. One of my friends has a problem, and I feel like I should tell somebody, but I don't know who to tell. I was like, well, talk to me about it. Or, you know, she was in ninth grade, I think. And I was like, well, what is it? And she told me her friend was hooked, what was doing heroin. Like uh, and I was like, uh, what the fuck? I didn't even know what heroin was. You know, it, I'd heard it, but I didn't know know it until I was right. older. But, it's like, you know, my high school, they now have in every classroom a Narcan station. Like, what the fuck? That's, that's not. Wow. Nope. Yeah, that's the, also how far my high school slid. Yeah. Well, my entire community slid. Yeah, the my neighborhood. I was in a. Uh, I grew up in a probably like middle class, lower middle class neighborhood in San Francisco, and um, like we had a tr- like uh, a trap house on the block. Well, I mean, it was like a crack house, really, because nobody was trapping out of it. Trapping is like you're selling out of someplace. Oh yeah. It was like a crack house. All crack kids lived there. And, um, and like, I didn't, nobody had a high mentality. Like, uh, they, it, it was, they were basically like pigeons. Like, they didn't matter. Like, we didn't look at crack heads like they were human, um, which is bad. I know, I know it's not all right. But, um, you know, and they were just like furniture that moved. It didn't matter. Like, they get into fights with each other. It was the funniest shit on the planet, we thought, you know. Well, yeah, 53, I mean, your kids. 53 swings. Yeah, 53 swings, no connects, and they both fell down 20 times. Like, it was the funniest shit ever. Um, okay, I was, I, 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 had, I hate to admit it, but I think that I, even today I'd find that amusing watching two people uh, swinging. I'm not gonna lie. Like, like oh, flailing yeah. and never hitting, but still falling. I, I think uh, I'd be, my ass off. I'd be the dumbass rooting it on. You're whooping his ass. You're getting him. You know, and they're ten feet apart, not realizing it. I'd be, um, I'd be laughing and calling like nine one one, and be like, "Yo, there's a couple of like crackheads out here fighting. They're not going to hurt each other, but they might hurt themselves." Right? Yeah. And then they would respond. Cops respond six hours later because, <laughs> but it's a different episode too. <laughs> but um, so um, hard drugs were not were not okay. Uh, by any means, in in the early early mid nineties, um, in my town or, there were a few people on hard drugs. Pretty much everybody knew who it was, but not like we actually had one guest on here. I had no clue. Meth head. Yeah, but our school. I mean, we graduate. We're about the same age. Our school wasn't like that. It was just like oh, okay, whatever. That's your thing. Yeah. So there was like. In high school, there's one cat who was a cousin of the inner circle. Like, I had a group of guys that I hung out with, not in the gang. I had, like, two different groups of friends. And this uh, this group, we used to call it, we just call it game. Because all of us, all we were doing was spitting game 24-7. Wasn't violent. A bunch of skaters, taggers, into fashion. Not, like, high fashion, but, like... Street fashion. The street fashion, exactly. Uh, and one of them would... Um, we do coke, and it was um, it was like the dirty little secret. Like we all knew, but nobody talked about it, and like we'd whisper about it behind her back a little bit. But it was just like, I can't believe they're doing that, you know. And so uh, we'll see how different my life turned later on. So basically, <laughs> that was like the Bruno. Now that we have, yeah. it. honestly. Thank you, Encanto, for giving us such a relatable taboo, Bruno. Mm. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. You should watch Encanto. Oh, we don't, man. Yeah, we don't talk that is about a Bruno. Sin. Yeah, we don't talk about Bruno. I'm just going to say it's <laughs> probably the greatest Disney movie since The Lion King. Okay. The, um, so a big part of what desensitized me to crackheads is um, I was kind of lightly bullied in middle school, but I was a big dude. Um, and uh, I was a nerd. Played D&D, like, hung That's out with... That's funny. Some... Did you read the comment I put in there? In the chat room? Where? 
pretty sure. Because <laughs> I used to play D&D with David and then Bo. So I was like, hey, off topic, but guess what? <laughs> like, today we went and got the dice. <laughs> nice. The uh, I got a giant bag of dice right here somewhere. So, um, <laughs> so uh, one of the older guys in the neighborhood, like, gave me up and was like, you know, you're a big dude. Why don't you just fight back? And I'm like, at first I was like, I don't want to hurt anybody. And he's like, you'd rather be hurt? I'm like, well, no, I'm scared to fight. He's like, he's like, fight back. Just fight back. This is kind of how you fight. This is kind of what you do, yada, yada, yada. Um, you get enough of and, them, you'll figure it out. Right. Like the summer, summer after eighth grade, uh, I had to go to summer school. Um, somebody tried to punk me in, uh, at summer school. Um, and I didn't know how to fight. I didn't know how to throw a punch. I was a big dude. So I picked up a fucking chair and hit him with it and it was done. I was like, it's that easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and so. I gained the skill. Weapons. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and then I was always dressed kind of bummy, and the same dude was like, "Hey, um, you know, why, you know, why, why don't, why are you dress like that? Like, you, you always like stop being a stop being a dork." And I was like, "I was like, my mom was broke. Like, I ain't got no money, you know. I mean, I was one of those kids who had uh, you can get the free lunch at school, kids." And um, he's like, "Why don't you, you know, why don't you?" start grinding and I was like I, I, I don't know what that is what that means and so he put me on how to sell crack and it was double ups they're, they're all dubs he started me off with the 20 dub dub means that it's not like today where people talk about a dub it's 20 bucks a dub back then was you double your money like I gave him like he gave me 20 bucks I turned uh, 20 bucks worth of crack wholesale I guess you would call it uh, it's it worth 40 form. I bring the 40 back to him and gives me 80. Bring the 80 back to him and get 160. It just keep dubbing. And, and then eventually um, starts going, I don't need all of this to be doubled. I could keep some for myself. Uh, eventually what it turned out, my mom figured out, like by the age 15, that I was selling. I was selling. So it's funny, like the word dope means something. No matter what city you go to, everybody listening, I say, if I'm referring to a drug and I say dope, you're going to have so many different people think uh, I'm talking about different things. When I say dope, I mean crack, right? And so when when I was selling dope, um, my mom found out I was selling dope, and she gave me that whole speech. You know, like, uh, I, I can't remember. I said it on the show. I know I told E was, um, you know, if you're going to be uh, a doctor, be the best doctor and save all the lives. If you're going to be a cop, be the best cop and arrest all the bad people be a drug dealer, be the best drug dealer because I'm bailing your ass out of jail. Now, I need help with rent. <laughs> Give me some money. <laughs> and so I started helping my mama out with rent, yeah. right? So, um, and I sold dope for a long time. Uh, well, what felt like a long time uh, back then. Um, and I started and because I was like the relationship I had with my dad, my dad by that time, my mom had let him come and live in this little room we had in the garage. No bathroom or anything down there. It wasn't even like a finished room. It was just so he wasn't homeless anymore because he was homeless off and on for like a decade. And um, and like I was just like really disenchanted with, with him. Um, and I saw what drugs did to him. And I didn't necessarily lose respect for him because I, I never – stop being appreciative of, for the dad he was when I had him as my dad. But, um, like, it just grew something dark in me. So it's watching watching people, like, go through it. There's this one dude on the block. Uh, they used to call him uh, maintain, what do they call him? They call him money when he had money and maintain when he didn't. Uh, he was a semi-pro boxer, or no, uh, he, he was pro for a year, um, and he was he was a really really talented fighter. He started smoking crack, and he slowly withered away. And so he went from like I would go serve him at his house, 
sell it or like uh, go sell him some rocks. And like he literally, they had one bedroom where uh, they you didn't want to go into the bathrooms anymore. The waterman shut off, power shut off, gas shut off. They would shit in buckets and just put lids on the buckets. Wouldn't even empty them. So they had a bedroom full of buckets full of shit with lids on them every time they fill it. Like uh, recycling day, they were the people going down the block digging through everybody's recycling to cash it in so they can buy rocks. Like the mighty of fawn, he went from driving really nice cars, uh, you know, finding really, really beautiful people to date. Uh, having really nice things to, like, I mean, it, like, it, it might have fallen. Um, and I didn't care because of how I saw it affect my life. And I'm like, these people are the way that they are. Um, and David, just, you know, it's not my fault. David just Don't made get a pretty good me. comment. What's that? David said, some can use without abuse, but others get lost in it. It's a hard journey. For sure. Uh, that was me. For a long time uh and I'll, I'll definitely get to that part of my story you know uh like functioning alcoholics fun- functioning meth users functioning cokeheads functioning um it's funny a lot of people think i guess it's not funny a lot of people think they're functioning add your substance here when they're really not yeah you know i've done a few i, I had a conversation with somebody at a party once <laughs> Who is like, you know, I, I really appreciate how Coke is becoming more socially acceptable. I was like, motherfucker, Coke is only socially acceptable to other Cokeheads. Yeah. Don't get that twisted. And he's yeah. like, what? Really? I was like, you need to look at the people you're kicking it with. <laughs> <laughs> now, hand me that straw. Um, oh. <laughs> the, um... Okay, okay. So uh... you use Coke. I got to ask just because did you ever snort Coke from the ass crack of a stripper? Not the ass crack. I snorted it off of someone's ass and boobs, different body parts. <laughs> I had to ask. I've I've, 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 I've snorted off of it, like not having stuff. Like had had my buddies. I had a buddy who had like no body hair. I was like, I was like, turn your arm over. I'm like, what? I was like, I need your flat ass forearm. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> and I fucking lined it up on his forearm and did it off his forearm. Because I stuck a straw in a bag once and learned never stick the straw in the bag to snort ever. You will always get way more than you bargained for. Don't do it. Um, so basically a good way to get yourself okay. in the ER or killed. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's like addiction. Sarah says, yeah, it's like addiction versus yeah. tendency. One is biological response and one is state of mind. Some can use and some let it use them. Sarah and I have had some well, really well amazing, said, amazing conversations on on the subject where she's helped me understand a lot of things. Does she want to jump uh, in on this? If she's talked about this to at length, I don't know. Uh, she she's downstairs with the kiddo, so I don't okay. know. Yeah, um, she would actually be better. She can. Where I can talk about like the street experiences. Sarah is so amazingly brilliant and well read. So she just she she researches stuff for fun like people are trying to write their doctorate. <laughs> okay, that's a little more research than I do, but I, I get it. I yeah. ADHD mind and internet access. Yeah, I talking to her, she was researching something and uh I was like, Yeah, WebMD makes everybody a doctor. She's like, That's for amateurs. I'm like, what? She's like, I go for information where doctors go for information. I was like, ah, all right, well, I'm dumb. Yeah, yeah. I went to public school, so. There's a reason yeah. that uh, doctors, when they hear WebMD, <laughs> you just see them cringe. Oh, yeah. But, uh, like, I will talk to Sarah about any of my medical s- stuff before I talk to my doctor, so I know how to root out the shit that my doctor might think it is, just so I can prepare myself for those conversations. And my, um, my wife being a nurse, yeah, I... I I can just give her my symptoms and she'll come up and be like, it's probably this. Go to the doctor and make sure, you know, get that verified. Oh, okay. Yeah. We now have a, we now have a friend, uh, PubMed baby. There you go. That's the one. Um, oh, thank you, Sarah. So for, for everyone else that's, that's listening, that's not in the chat room. Sarah just said, I would love to delve in sometime on this for sure. Oz has an amazing point of view on all this. 
I'd def make myself available some night. And then Bo said, addiction can express itself via obsessions, including research. And Sarah said, pub bed, yeah. baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And there's like so many different kinds of addiction. Like we'll, we'll be primarily talking oh. about my experience with, with, um, with uh, addictive substances tonight. Where However, I have a screen time. I have a, uh, yeah, screen time addiction. Yeah, I st- there's that. Do. My average so, cell phone time alert that I got on Sunday, because every Sunday it tells you, it's all, you were down 12%. You average 11 hours and 32 minutes a day. Yeah, wow. I got a serious problem. Yeah, yeah so, oh, so do I, yeah. I was, I'm about efficiencies. I'm an efficiency guy, right? And so I wasn't getting enough done around here. And uh, honestly, like, I mean, not to put all of our business out there, but Sarah and I really weren't connecting as much as we both wanted to. Um, and a big part of that would be I'd be getting in bed and she wants to sit down and talk and I'm in TikTok land, Instagram or whatever, uh, and ignoring her. Like it got to the point where uh, deleting TikTok and Instagram off of my phone literally improved our relationship and make, I did more shit around the property. Um, which you know what think about that right now as we speak i put it back on my phone uh i'm deleting it off my phone right now because i don't need your screen time addiction remove app there we go bye-bye um so the but back to my experience so i started selling it um things changed um a little bit so mid the rave scene got really, really big in San Francisco. And San Francisco um, is basically the heart and soul, the, the, the birthplace of the rave. Yeah. It, uh, it's they. Um, I miss those raves. I'm not going to lie. Like, I used to go to raves for the love and appreciation of music and dance, not to get loaded. And when I got out of the rave scene, because I was still on raves forever. By the time I got out of it and stopped DJing, like it was people were going to get the best hookups to get the most fucked up. And I'm like, it doesn't matter how good of a set I spin. Don't nobody like don't don't nobody actually understand it, hear it, see the theme, the story I'm trying to tell with my set or whatever, you know? Yeah. He, he's hiding behind a shirt. Is yeah. my breath that bad, dude? I'm sorry. No, it, my beagle busted ass and left. Oh, yeah, oh. Cry fucking crop dusted me. <laughs> um, the um, but so as the the rave scene became popular, um, I guess I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So I got my ex pregnant in. Uh, 90, early 95, I was graduating high school, well, I was supposed to graduate. I, I made it through 12th grade. I got a GED. Uh, I cut way too much school. Uh, but I was living in Sacramento. Like, I had got into a lot of trouble in the city. I've been shot. I've been stabbed. Stabbed and sliced up. Um, with the, the, uh, yeah. So dumb gang violence shit. And, um, I decided, uh, it, it took me a year to leave the city after that happened too, maybe a little bit longer, but, uh, I went to, uh, I went up to SAC and, um, by the time I came back uh, from my senior high school, by the time I came back, um, I had, I had done enough soldiering for the gang that I was in where and they knew I had they knew I had a daughter like it, I just let it go they let it go they knew I'm not about that life I can't be about that life it was respected um and so it's kind of funny that you say that is, um where I met David and Bo the team that we were on at the company that we worked at was filled with a lot of ex gangbangers and almost all of them got out of it about the time they had families. And even when they were still in it and had kids, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember that time that you rolled up on us and opened fire. It's like, yeah, I deliberately aimed high because your kids were there. Yep. Like, But still, yep. you've opened fire with the kids there. 
Yeah. That, that, but yeah, there was that respect of we're not going to harm your family. We're just going to scare you. It's another show we could talk about, like the the intricacies of, uh, of gang life and politics. Like it is it's different. Like the difference between gang mentality and civilian mentality. Like you don't anybody who's not in a gang is a civilian. You don't fuck with civilians. Civilians are cop callers. Like I go and shoot somebody from a different gang, they're not going to call the cops on me. Somebody who heard the gunshots is going to call the cops. And when the cops show up, you're going to be like, you know who shot you? Nope. Because they're going to deal with them themselves, right? But yeah, it's a whole they, They're story. already getting, they're already planning their revenge. For sure. For sure. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, it was weird being there, you know, coming from the sticks and learning that the gangs actually had an etiquette and a code oh, of conduct. The reason that I'm so respectful, like, I don't, I'm not the most eloquent speaker on the planet. Um, and my my morals may seem really kind of foobar to most people, but my morals are strong as oak. They don't bend. They don't test. They don't break. My morals are what they are. Um, and a big part of that is because of how I was raised up in gang culture. You know, um, I'll get back on topic in just a second, but here, here's an example. There's lines in the sand. Everybody knows what lines. You have, everybody has like a, a buddy, right, that uh, you might shit talk with or you'll you'll tease. Everybody knows the line, right? Um, like with, you know, Jimmy, I can never say anything about his mom. With, you know, Jay, I can never say, it's arbitrary names. I can never say anything about weight and, and whatnot. Right. Um it's the there are some hard and fast lines period where where i was at where you don't cross them it's all based on general principle like don't be disrespectful like meaningfully disrespectful and i bet i've acted out of pocket and gotten socked in my face really really hard and uh most people who wouldn't understand it be like oh it's about to be a big ass fight and i'm like no i earned that that's my bad i was out of pocket and I've done the same thing to people that like are my homies, you know. You cross like, the line. Just cross the line, and it's lucky in our in where I was, it was just a fight, you know. Uh, it was a punch in the face. If somebody slapped you, someone's going to the hospital because that's straight disrespect. If I saw shit to somebody and they slap me, nah, someone's got to go in traction. Like I can't let that stand. Um, if it's a fist. It's a different story. Yes. Yes. Wow. You know, which okay. uh, it, it's all, all about respect, right? Um, like you don't slap another man in a real fight. You slap somebody that you don't think is a threat. You're looking down on them. But like I said, that could be for another episode if you want down the line. Anyway, um, I want man, just schedule it. <laughs> <laughs> the, as long um, as we can tie it in with mental health, let's schedule it. Dude, my. Let's foreshadow a little for that episode. Um, the only reason I was in a gang is because one of eight white kids at my high school. And nobody liked white kids. I was in a gang for protection. I did not like the fights I was in. I was really good at fighting. Did not like hurting people. Did not like getting into fights. Um, but there were expectations. And I had a lot of mental anguish about it. I'll even bring on some of my old poetry. You can hear what a gang-banging emo sounds like. <laughs> that is a term I had never thought I'd ever hear. Like, I never thought I'd ever hear those two words cobbled together. <laughs> those three words. Right. And C. Yeah. C, you want to grab that yeah. comment in there? Get your voice in here. Um, let me find this. Or I can grab it if you want me to. Uh, is it David? Yep. There's a difference between a lesson versus a tune-up. Hey, Alice, you're muted. <laughs> That's good, because I misgendered. <laughs> I'll own that one. I'm trying to get better. That is a person who sounds like the new... It happens. Talking. Yeah. And what were you saying about Dave there? That sounds a person what? Who knows what they're talking about? There, there's a distinct difference between a lesson and a tune up. Like, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, 
you spank a child, you don't whoop a child half to death. Or now you don't do either. But when I was growing up, you know, <laughs> it's absolutely I love how you got your ass kicked. Yeah, Dave sounds like he's dropping fire in the chat room right now. Yeah. But so I come back from Sacramento. People are starting to get into the rave scene. And all of a sudden, you're allowed to do stuff other than smoke weed and not be a base head. I'm like, when did the rules change? Uh, But the rules have changed and ecstasy hit the scene. And also, you went from one region to another. Well, I went from San, I went from San Francisco. Yeah, moved to Sacramento for my senior high, year of high school. Went back to San Francisco. Ah, uh, and at that point, it changed. So I was back. So I was back in the city, mom, living with my mom. Mom was still in the same neighborhood, same place. She lived there for like 15, 16 years. I lived in that same neighborhood virtually my whole life until I moved out of San Francisco. Um, and uh, I'm not going to ever, you probably never hear me talk about what neighborhood it is because it is where anything that I discuss here is things that would have happened there. And it, it's too telltale. So I'll never do that. Um, no, that's, I'm not that's anonymous fine. with my name, but I'll be anonymous with that. No, that's uh, that's fair. And I, I know from talking to the people where I used to work was, that even yeah, after they've been out of the life for a while, there are some neighborhoods yeah. they still cannot go near. Yeah, like... And certain things they she, cannot say. Yeah, like, she's been dead between that neighborhood and, and who they used to funk with. And, like, you know, I go to the city, go and ask me, and I'm 45 years old, and had nothing to do with that life forever. And I'm still, like, looking around, like, like it's a hostile environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I you... Could, I, odds are, if you find any of those OGs like you, they're going to be like, dude, been forever, how you doing? <laughs> That's what I've right? noticed. It's like there could be yeah. from rival gangs, and afterwards they're just like, "Dude, how you doing?" <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, out no of the girl. life. Yeah, the so through through high school, and the only people I ever saw who was addicted to anything was addicted to crack, and it totally ruined their lives. Uh, like maintain came up to me and was like, "I need a rock." One time, and I was like, I was fourteen, kind of new to the game. And I was like, well, I need money. And he's like, he's like, let me get you to tomorrow. Let me get you to tomorrow. I was like, miss me with that. I'll get my sister to suck your dick. I was like, I'll beat your ass right now and get off the face. Like, that's your kin. Like, what the fuck? Um, but, um, and thinking about it, Maintain was a professional boxer. Telling him I'm going to whoop his ass. He's like, my bad, boss. My bad. Like, Wow. Yeah, you know. Uh, I yeah, didn't know he was a boxer until way later. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, he would, he would have probably lit you the fuck up even being a crackhead, but, you know. But that just goes to show how much he... Um, he personality yeah, change. Slid, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, we got a I'm new so glad listener. to be here, CJ. Yeah, um, we got a number of new listeners on tonight. This is awesome. Hey, welcome, welcome to the MI Mental Fam. The um, so this whole rave scene thing, like, uh, I got into it pretty deep. Like, I did. Uh, I started taking ecstasy. Um, I took it for the first time when I went to my first rave, and uh, still one of my favorite DJs is today. To this day is DJ Aphrodite. And I was on like a whole different level. Like I was still thugnificent in my head from that life. And I remember sitting down, uh, watching Aphrodite spin halfway through his sit his his his, his set. I still remember it. it was a pure love press bill. Still remember the kind. And I was like uh that night I was I was so fucked up, I remember like thinking Wow, music is my religion. My God is a DJ. Like, it was just the Wub Wubs were, were hitting me hard. And well, um, I mean, the Wub Wubs are awesome. Right. And then, so, like, scientifically speaking, they say that ecstasy is not addictive. Uh, it's not really considered a hard drug. Like, you would consider, like, you don't think, like, 
you know, crack and heroin and cocaine and ecstasy, like, you know, three of these things are doing the same thing. One of these things are doing its own. Like ecstasy is not in that group of things as hard drugs that are addictive like the rest, we think. But that drug, all the, all the regret that I had from hurting people I didn't know because they were from a place that I never went to because one of their friends said some faulty shit to one of my friends and they got into a fight. So it's fight on site for everybody in both crews. Stupid shit. Like feeling really bad that I put hands on some people that it just wasn't fair. I'm like, I'm a big dude and or somebody yeah, run really their are. mouth, you know, somebody run their mouth and I remove their ability to move their mouth, you know? So it's, it's bad. And, but I got to walk away with it. Like, yeah, suck of what, you know, and really feeling like guilt, like deep, like self hatred for doing that to another human being. It's so like, I mean, basically you, every time you hit them, you were actually putting a little slice on your own soul. Is what it sounds like. It was after the fights. Cause in the moment I'm very, I'm very technical. I'm very like linear thinking when it comes to that. Um, it's really helped it when I, like I've done mixed martial arts. I've taken a bunch of different things and it's planning things out. The first time I saw um, the Sherlock Holmes movies, you know how he plans out the fights in his head? Yeah. Uh, and the, yeah, that's how it would be. Like, I'm going to do this to cause him to do that. This will be my reaction. This is what I'm going to strike. And it was, I don't fight out of anger. It is very methodical. And it probably comes from back then because I wasn't fighting out of anger. I was fighting out of necessity. Um, I didn't want to get into a fight, but I had to. And it was like literally like either I beat those guys up or the guys who I call my friends are going to beat me up. So, uh, and the the devil you know can be way scarier than the devil you don't. And I knew the shit my friends had done compared to this person who I had never seen before. They just happened to be wearing the wrong color, doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong shit. So with all of that, fucking darkness in me first time i take ecstasy it's gone 100 percent gone no guilt no self-consciousness like i'm a big dude now and i'm like 270 i was like back then i was 365 um you know i i remember celebrating when i got down to a size 46 pants right um back then and it was um so in being a bigger dude, like I was super self-conscious. And back then when I was young, Sarah recently saw some pictures of me before I grew facial hair. And like when I had, like I was, like everything about that, about that time was all super machismo shit. And like, if I, if I, and I used to do my hair, like everybody in a booyah, like basically sides and back, shave long hair, hair down to my ass. If my hair was down, my rubber band broke or whatever, I had people go, you know, excuse me, ma'am. And I turn and look at them like, oh, dude. And they would look me in the face and go, ma'am? Like, looking kind of androgynous. To somebody who's super machismo, that is not okay back then. You know? Right. And I'd be like, dude. And be like, oh, my bad. Right? Um, so I get the misgendering a little bit. That's why I try so damn hard. <laughs> right? Um, That's all you got to do. Yeah. 100% honest effort. And, um, but like that self-consciousness gone, fear of things gone, sad feelings gone. And I just felt like I loved everything. The physically addictive, no, but that just sense of well-being and positivity when you are in your day-to-day -day life is a super dark place that's a dark drug and so i started eating more pills started selling pills um i got so into that i've always been a sales guy i, I went from selling a pill here and there to selling a boat a week about a thousand pills you know um and it was easy back then and most of them were like 
there were like not a really lot of big sales. I was hitting two to three raves a weekend, go to one, leave early, go to another, go to another one the next day. They had a lot more raves back then. And um, I was eating like six, seven, eight, ten pills a night just so I wouldn't feel bad. Um, and people will do some shit to not feel empty, right? Um, yeah. And that's where the Ooh, man, tell me about it, right? Um, I did a lot of I did a lot of things when I was younger to to not do that. Um, I was a, I was a player when I was younger, like super self conscious, three hundred sixty five pounds, like you know, not a lot, not a lot of people's type in San Francisco. You know whose type I was at three hundred sixty five pounds, six foot. Bears, bears in San Francisco loved me. <laughs> and I was like, I'm. I, that, I I appreciate it, and you make me feel good about myself for that. However, yeah, that's not happening, homie. <laughs> like, it's, thanks for no thanks. Um, and uh, and you were persistent back then too, like like comically, like no shame. Anyway, yeah, um, and when I was a teenager, in my hometown. I was the one that was bullied. I was the one that was picked on. I was the nerd. No one liked me. You know, I had my friends, but it just felt like I was ugly and unattractive. Mm -hmm. And it was only gay men that pursued me. Adult yeah. gay men pursuing a 15, 16 year old boy. Yeah. Put this in perspective. Like I've, I like, I've had, <laughs> haven't, haven't had a lot of friends in the family. One of them put it in perspective to me and he's like you should take that as a compliment and i was like what do you mean he's like try to get as close to verbatim as possible he's like honey we're the pickiest motherfuckers on the planet if we like you there's something in you um, as long as it's not you i'm good <laughs> <laughs> right and i was just like yeah that's okay yeah, one one of them, <laughs> one of them, I actually wound up becoming a pretty good friend with overall. Yeah, when he stopped pursuing and just was honestly him. Yep. Yeah, he was actually was a really good dude, and he was like, "I'm sorry that I did that." It's just like, "Damn, you're attractive," and I'm just like, "Uh, I'm still uncomfortable with that." <laughs> 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 no, but um, I miss the dude now. I really miss him. Animus now, uh, I used to actually work with who became his husband. Nice. Yeah, the... So, the emotional and mental addiction to not feeling like that, um, I, it's really hard to explain. Um, it got to the point where... Um, like, I mean, I'm an old dude now, so I wake up and I take six pills every morning and I take a couple shots a week, you know, all because my doctor says do it or die. Um, so, and that's basically how I was treating uh, ecstasy, you know, it was before they call it, before Molly, Molly and ecstasy are different. Molly, for the most part, is MDA, ecstasy is MDMA. Um, but it's... Um, but I'd wake up in the morning and pop a pill. You know, it's uh, kind of like there was a popular song not uh, a, a little while back. Like, I said, I wake up, I brush my teeth with a bottle of Jack, like type of mentality, but with pills. Um, and it got to the point where when you're young, you get a lot of serotonin. You can take pills for a long time and still be all right. Um, but once, once that well runs dry, which it um, will you end up you're still self-conscious you're still feeling dark um about the things uh, you're just in a dark place about the shit you don't like about yourself um but then on top of it instead of all the judge regular judgment you have this the worst deepest depression ever and you don't feel like you can ever come out of it. You know, and as your body starts to recover, you're like, oh, I'm getting a little serotonin back. You know, let me take some more and just wreck that whole train. So, um, 
what it comes down to for me and reflecting upon it, the reason I was filling a void with it, right? Um, I was, there was stuff that was missing, some sort of validations that were missing. And, um, and Sarah just dropped in the, um, nautical, like, yeah, the, her, the my physio- brain, yeah, the physiological effects. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, my big brain, baby. She, uh, she knows. Yeah. Your receptors you kill themselves off and become less responsive. Harder to recover the longer you go. I'm, I'm glad I'm with her. Cause she's so much smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, do not put yourself down. You're still oh, one of the smartest I, people I've met. I, I and don't think I'm being. Uh, I am. I am not uh, uh, talking down about about myself at all. By by any means. I mean, if anything, I have a problem with my ego. Uh, so I, I don't think I'm dumb. I don't think I'm the smartest dude on the planet. Hey Dave. I'm really, really wise though. Hey Dave, you if know? you're still on and listening, how bad's my ego? <laughs> You know, give, give it about 12 uh, seconds for the reply. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the things that we're, we'll do, even if we know we're doing ourselves harm, just to seek out a feeling. Not realizing back then, I mean, I was self-medicating. I should have probably been on antidepressants or been on uh, fucking hug therapy or something, you know, because uh, whooping a motherfucker's ass therapy was not working. <laughs> yeah, know. well, you have that strong moral code. Yeah, that that's been a big, that's been a big topic of discussion with Sarah uh, several times. Is that um, I hold myself to a standard in which she feels that I am setting myself up for fail, and I feel like I fail myself fairly often. Um, you know, but it's. But it's that moral compass and holding myself to that standard that has allowed me to accomplish the things I have in life. So it's kind of hard not to continue with it when I see the, where I feel like the the ends justifies the means, kind of. So um, my my big thing that I kind of had this revelation one day about the whole the ends justify the means uh, mentality is that the ends cannot be moral if any of the means were immoral to get there. So even I, if they may justify so, it, it doesn't mean that it was done morally or ethically. So so where I come my, seeing this is where my morals are fucked, come, where some people are, uh, where some people are concerned, I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks is moral or immoral. I care what I think is moral and moral. And so it may not it, it, you know, it, it may not wash for yourself, but, um, and see, this is for, where I would want me, to, this is where I'd be like, okay, explain to me how what you just did is moral. I'd like to know from your angle, but of course we'd have to be in a situation where that comes yeah. up. But that's yeah, also like, me so, being, um, but that's just me being me. I like to get to know other people. I like to know how they mm-hmm. operate and how they think episode one of this season we talked about um or was it or was it episode 100 we were talking about black and white thinking right yeah and that leads me to moral indignation uh or uh you know um or righteous indignation um where to this day like i'm a loving guy you've shown i'm you, you've seen i'm caring anybody who knows me knows I'm a, I'm a really caring individual uh I will beat a motherfucker up in a heartbeat if I think that it's necessary and not take joy in it just because I feel like it's the thing that needs to happen because it's, it's what needs to happen. And a lot of people think that's not moral. Violence is never right. I'm, I'm glad you have a stance and you feel strongly about something. And I hope that works out for you in your life. Don't do anything that's going to cause me to have to whoop your ass. And we'll both be okay. You know, uh, Example, somebody beating up uh, from the last three out of the last four fights I've been in were, were guys beating on their girlfriends in public. I, I don't, you know, I'm not, hey, sir, stop. Please don't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. No, I'm beating somebody's ass. You don't put hands on a woman. 
you know, don't, it's the way I was raised, right? And a lot of people will say that that's not moral. How are you going to fight violence with violence very effectively to make it stop, in my opinion? And it, it's okay if you don't agree with me, you know, uh, if people think think bad of that. But um, that's, I mean, that's where I stand morally. But, and I got to, I go to bed, you know, I got to sleep with myself at night, right? I, I Nobody else has to. I need to know that I did what I had to do to, to handle a situation that I feel is moral. All right. The, the chat just it has exploded. And David made me cry. I'm still wiping away tears. Thank you, David. I, I... It's too, uh, afraid to face your dark places. You try to fake until you make, but the ones who knew you, well, we saw where you were. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful thing to be seen. It's a beautiful thing to be seen. You know? And you guys get to see my ugly face. I'm ugly when I cry. <laughs> Yeah. You can't see him, David, but you move him for sure. You did. Uh, Tr Trummel? Trummel? Tr Trummel? I've always yeah, just called him Trummel. <laughs> sorry if I'm hacking it up. Uh, yeah, but that's how uh, we're well, you all got to read what he says. <laughs> Otherwise, that? you got to say what he said. Because if you're just that's... answering what he said without reading it. I'm reading it. Yeah, but I'd be reading it out loud. That's what I just started to do, and then you cut me off. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> you can't see me through your tears. That's okay. Oh, no, I can't. Right. I can't. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh. but that's how uh, morality works. Because bad guys don't think uh, they're bad guys. They're the good guys of their story, right? Yeah, it's perception. Um, yeah, I mean, perception's huge, right? Like, I see some guy beating up some girl. I beat up that guy. And then somebody who didn't see that guy beating up that girl just sees some big ass dude beating up some guy. Like, you know, it's everybody. Yeah. Everybody has a story. Um, yeah. Different between truth and the turn of my truth. Yeah. Sarah, women, kids, and animals. Oh, yeah. Like, I'll do, I'll do something if I see somebody beaten. Beating on a beating on a lady or beating on a kid. Let me see you hurting an animal. I'm okay with going to prison. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's actually kind of where I sit too. I see someone hurting an animal. I'm sorry. Yeah, like I'm much big... I'm much bigger now than when Dave met, uh, knew me. Like I'm a hundred pounds bigger now. Yeah, I will snap your fucking neck if you're hurting an animal. I'm sorry. Exactly. Yeah, my one of my roommates is the the biggest pa pacifist that I've come in contact with in a long time. Super like he he has a gentle soul, absolute genius. Love the dude to death. Um, and he he feels bad if he thinks he lightly insulted somebody. He feels bad about it. Like even that guy who super non confrontational will like start a full blown war over somebody who's not, not even hurting, mistreating animals. Not even like yeah. So animals. And if uh I know that Austin C noticed, but uh for everybody else, when I was crying my hardest, my beagle came up to check on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Animals are the best. Yeah. And Sadie's laying on my feet sleeping now too. Yeah. yeah, mine's right behind me. She's always right behind me. But then she probably always thinks I have food. That's my <laughs> thought behind it. Yeah. Uh, so. So. But, MDMA. <laughs> yeah, MDMA. Um, I think so, that was actually a worthy tangent, though. <laughs> yeah. Um. Self-medicating, right? A lot of addictions start, I think, 
in my experience, starts from self-medicating from something. Um, yeah, mine was peer pressure. I, re- I, I, wish, I, underst- I wish I understood um, what my dad... Well, I kind of understand part of why my dad self-medicated and why he became the way he did. He, at first, it was drinking, and then... You know, it was crack cocaine. He fucked around with heroin at one point. Um, it was, it didn't matter the drug, it was the escape. You know, um, I, I think if we understand the reasons that we're self-medicating, uh, or we understand the reasons somebody we care about is self-medicating, instead of trying to get that person to stop doing whatever substance that they're addicted to, Focus on the void they're trying to fill. Once that void is worked on and they, you remove that reason to self-medicate, you can then move on to the disease itself of addiction because... Root cause analysis. Getting, yeah. You know, getting, getting somebody to, to stop their addiction when they're doing it because they have a pain that, or, or something that's causing them to want to escape from it. Like you're, you're asking too much. Um, you know, so if we, if we can, if we can fill that void and we can be supportive, um, we can help them on their journey. Now, everybody's heard it, but I want to reiterate it. Nobody stops doing what they're addicted to until they want to do it Um, or they won't be successful. They may be, they may do it so that you don't leave them. Right. Like my dad did, you know, I'll stop drinking. So you don't leave me talking to my mom, but then it's transference. He's filling in the void with, with, with crack now. Um, Remove the reason for self-medication and hopefully you can start, start the healing on the rest. Um, for me, um, with eating so many pills, taking so much ecstasy, um, running from the feelings and the guilt that I harbored from living such a ruthlessly violent life, um, I came, I really kind of accidentally came to terms with everything. Um, I was going to work one day. I was in BART. I used to keep a journal. I still keep a journal that I don't write in enough. And I wrote like 28 pages. And I did, um, I still have to put it in our Discord. But uh, the five wives, right? I talked about it before. I asked myself, why do I feel this way? Why do I do this? Why do this because of X? Well, why is that okay? Okay, I do it because of this. It's not okay. Okay, if it's not okay, then why do I? Why do I feel I still do it? And I just went down the line, twenty-eight pages uh, into it, and it was like a quarter size, third size notebook, like twenty so, like, the pages. You call it the five wise, but that sounded like you went a good twenty, thirty wise deep or more. Oh, for sure. And sometimes you'll get it in two. Sometimes you'll get it in one. Right. But sometimes it'll take days. But I was ultimately what happened is that void was it wasn't necessarily filled, but I understood why there was a void at the end of it. And with understanding comes acceptance. And so because of that, I was able to process things differently and I was able to move away from that. Um, and so I I didn't stop taking but it went from you know up to 10 pills a day 12 pills a day every day uh to celebrate something you know once in a while and i didn't feel the need to do it again the next day you know um and it would it went back it went back to using it as a party enhancer instead of you know my psychological medication right right um so 
for others with addiction, um, everybody, everybody has their own reasons as to why they started. Every, you know, and, and the story that I hear again and again usually has to do with something that some inequity that they feel about themselves, not that, you know, something might've happened to them. They may not feel something about themselves. They feel they're missing something and they're running from those feelings. Um, the first step, especially if there's somebody close to you that you can do, is make sure they feel loved, not pitied and not loved and, and not given a lot of attention because they have a problem, but just because of who they are, because of the first, the, the reasons you first started to love them, remind them of that, you know, um, and you can kind of go from there. And the, um, the comment section has blown up over this. Can I read some of them? Yeah, so David said, if you don't fix yourself, you'll wind up addicted to something else just to forget the pain. CJ said, weed is self-medication, but I don't view it like X, like ecstasy. Sarah said there was a huge addiction study. This is like right on point with what you were saying too. They got rats addicted to morphine, gave them a button uh, to get it whenever they wanted. Then they gave them a community of the rats, play structure, stimulation, and they stopped regardless of withdrawal. Bo said, I'm great at quitting addictions cold turkey and for years. It took me decades to realize that this was a weakness, not a strength. Me, I've thrown there anything and, and everything can be self-medicating. Uh, Dromo, eventually whatever you are taking doesn't do it anymore. You either get up the dosage and possibly OD or you go to something worse. Bo said, I felt that I was not addicted to anything because I had power over it. And it just empowered me to not stop because I could stop whenever I wanted to. And I'm going to skip CJ really fast with this with Sarah saying control was your addiction. Bo said still is. And CJ was saying that's shadow work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bo said, I had zero control of anything that happened in my life growing up. Sarah said, I think a lot of people self-medicate because that's all they feel they can control. And then David dropped a bomb. No one really has control over their lives, just choices. Yeah. And sure. Drummle said, I have to stay in control, otherwise my evil destructive side comes out. And he, is an he isn't fun. So no drugs, no alcohol or anything to take the control away. And David said, the good thing about choices, you can always make a new one if the old one is not working. Yeah. David, you are dropping the... some fire tonight. For sure. Yeah, control, control is an illusion. Um, this is a discussion I had with my daughter uh, quite a few times while growing up. Like, control is an illusion. Um, the Even... Even people who try to just ape control out of, out of overpowering something, they still, there's still choice involved in the other people. Um, the one thing, the only thing that you can truly control, is like David said, is yourself. It's the choices you make. Yeah. Um, I have uh, said many times uh, to many people that, uh, like when our emotions get out of control, that's okay. It's okay to feel however you feel about whatever you feel. You have the right to feel that. It's the human condition. It's the human experience. Yep. And what you are responsible for, how you react to it. You can make the choice to control your reactions so that you're not negatively impacting the people around you from them. Right. But you can't control situations. And if your reaction to something or your feelings towards something is what someone would consider unhealthy, well, there's exercises you can do to take to have a healthier reaction from it. A lot of that comes from childhood trauma. You, it's a defense mechanism. Well, you don't need that defense mechanism anymore. Let's work on fixing that. Um, an analogy I love using, I got this from the Anxiety Treatment Center, Sacramento, which just because you're not in Sacramento, if you really need this place... They charge the same amount whether you're from New York City or Sacramento because the people that come in from out of the city, there's an Airbnb. So you can be there. But the one thing they said, and this is a cognitive behavioral therapy analogy, which is you take a path through this field. 
that you take it so many times, it's beaten down, it's worn down. You know every rock and pebble and crack in the ground. You know exactly how the grass grows on the sides. You know everything about it, but it leads you to an unhealthy place every time. What you need to do is blaze a new trail. And it is really hard because you are going to stumble and trip and stub your toe and twist your ankle, fall in holes, stuff like that. But eventually, that healthier path will start to get beaten and easy to take. And that old path that you used to take will start becoming overgrown and alien to you. And that is um, a way to be able to help with the emotional response. My current therapist also, because I was talking about, you know, you know, emotions are irrational. And she's like, no, that's not fair. That's not fair to emotions. Emotions are just emotions. They're neither irrational or rational. They are. Yeah. Sometimes the emotion is absolutely rational. Like when, for me, when my first grandbaby reached up for me to be picked up. Oh, yeah. I had a very rational emotion over that. I got super excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, when looking at how we respond to our emotions, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but the five wives, right? Don't ever try to do that in the moment. It, it's not going to work. You can't think clearly enough to do root cause analysis on on it but if you don't like how you respond to something ask yourself why did i why did i respond that way and that's, at what point and that's what one of happened the hardest did, I learn, ever ask. did i learn that that was a good thing to respond that way when has this ever been i got when have i ever gotten a positive response by doing that how has that ever been helpful you know how has it been uh, if it hasn't been helpful, what are the things that have gone wrong because of my responses this way? And these, these are questions you can ha ask yourself. You know, you don't have to and, discover this with anybody else. You know, they're, they're private answers. Yeah, and, and, also, and also, if your answer is, I don't know, that's fine. It's okay. It's okay. Don't think that you failed because of it. Do on well, it for a little while. Come back to it later. Ask and, a different question. And that's a great time to reach out to somebody you trust to have them talk through it. You'll, you'll find if you talk about your whys with somebody, um, you'll be more telling yourself and finding, finding out your own truths more than you're actually telling the person, right? They may be able to help you ask the questions you don't know to ask. Um, I, it's why I highly suggest therapy. Like the best therapists I've ever had ask way more questions and make statements. My current therapist For... has left me super uncomfortable with questions that make me sit there and blank. Yep. Best therapist I've had. There you go. Right. And I'm glad that uh -huh. I sh I'm still going to her. So, um, I've had, that's just the first, oh, I guess first, little less than first half of my life with addiction that I've had, uh, up until the rave scene. Um, so I'm going to ask you, considering time, we're at an yeah. hour and a half. We have an hour and a half left. We could always pick this up again on another episode if you want, or we could keep plowing forward. Yeah. Um, so talking to some people who listen to the show, they were, uh, they had suggested that we try for a couple hours, um, which I'm, which I'm open to. Um, I don't know if we want to go full three. I'm, I'm okay. What do with you think? See, I've been pretty quiet. Yeah. Um, I don't know. C was sure. the first one to actually do a full three, but it was like this one, captivating yeah. the whole time. <laughs> I just like the sound of my own voice, man. <laughs> well, it's a dead sexy voice. All my nasaliness. <laughs> and uh, Sarah said if we want to do yeah. another, she'll join in. There we go. There we go. Uh, that's, that's worth waiting for. You know, so you want to do uh, the second half of your life with Sarah? Yeah, we could. I would that'd definitely be awesome. Um, fill one of those. Interesting. 
Yeah, fill it open. <laughs> we have a few of those. <laughs> hey, actually, the 29th is open. That's two weeks. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll share the calendar and and uh, we'll we'll get it locked down. Yeah, the, the rest of my life in, in addiction um, moved away from that, and there's just going to be in case it's you get triggered by the subject, which you've already heard a lot about tonight. Uh, it is all about cocaine. Lots and lots and lots of cocaine. Um, it is why I sound nasally when I talk now. No deviated septum, you would think. However... Now, you just burnt it yourself uh, a third nostril. Yeah, but... Yeah, I feel like it. Um, so. And actually, David just really nailed it about the feel of this show right now. It's like Saturdays back in the day when it was slow at work and we had all these long conversations. We would literally go hours between calls. So we'd have these really long, deep conversations. When we weren't fucking yeah. around. <laughs> Which we did often. <laughs> Hell, we even played Dungeons and Dragons at work. Like, literally broke out the books, the dice, the pencils, the paper, the full That's nine awesome. at work. And when a call would come in, it's like, okay, well, let's focus on a different part of the action now. (laughs) (laughs) I remember um, I was uh, at Apple. You had to sign up for uh, weekend manager shows. And there would only be one manager in the entire building on weekends. Um, There were three managers for three different shifts each day. And I remember I was closing manager one day and something happened and iOS and somebody, uh, you know, Ask me if I can come down and take a look. And I'm walking down the aisle, and there's a, uh, I call him a kid because he's super young, but there's a kid there playing World of Warcraft. And um, or it was a Sunday, actually, because I had gone to church. So I was wearing, like, my nice jeans, cowboy hat. Like, I was, you wouldn't think I grew up Doug, and, and I'm super Western. But yeah, the, my first impressions of you was, like, dudes from Texas or, or uh, New Mexico. No. Yeah. No. Nah. A nah, I'm an inner city Frisco. product. <laughs> yeah, I'm an inner city product for sure. And uh, actually, you know, I got I got my stuff right here. Can't wear wet glasses. Though. None of y'all can see it, but and I, and bad. actually, and it it fits you. That's the thing. Like stetsons yeah. don't fit at just anybody. It fits you. Yeah. Well, it's the broad shoulders matches the broad brim. <laughs> <laughs> the um. Yeah. So, I forgot what I was saying. Poof, gone. We were, we were talking squirrel about, fell off the wheel. Yeah, we were, I know that we were talking about um, just continuing this episode on an open, yep. share it with Sarah, and then, which would be great to get her on, because, I mean, she drops fire constantly. She, Sarah's so brilliant. Uh, she's, um, seen a, and in her, she's seen a good chunk of your life at this point, too. Maybe not half, but she's seen some of you, and she knows your past. So... Sarah and I were have been together twice. Uh, the first time, um, she really became my safe space. Like, it was in Kansas City. Uh, I've I've learned with a change of with a change of venue, you can have a change of life. And so, uh, all the dark shit that occurred with me from living in the Bay Area, living the way that I was living, there were expectations of me to be that way. And um, my first move to Sacramento, I got to change that. I moved back to the city after Sacramento, and um, I returned to that kind of that thug mentality. And then I moved to Kansas City. And I realized nobody knows me here. My first six months at Can- in Kansas City, I didn't have a single friend. Um, I would literally go and work out work out uh, one of two cafes for a couple few hours a day just so I could be around people but didn't make a, a single friend. And so when I met her, uh, we hit it off really quickly. I was, you know, she can tell the story. Um, it's embarrassing for me to say it. But um, yeah, I turned super giddy, embarrassed. Uh, I was so enamored with her. And um, like this yeah, overconfident, borderline cocky, you know, um, individual turns into like a tee hee hee embarrassed kind of guy uh, when I was around her. But I realized she didn't know, 
she didn't know anybody I knew. She didn't know, and because she didn't know anybody I knew, she was so far removed, she was safe to talk to. Um, and so she got the full unabridged version of my life and who I am and what I'm about. And I, I was able to bear my soul to her. So she, she knows me definitely better than most. And then by the roots repeat when we come back into each other's lives so many years later. So I'm, I'm super blessed to have, to have Sarah in my life. I've always said good people bring good people into their lives. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, that should be a, a good episode. I think um, so. And I still, I'm, I'm just going to, I don't know if I announced it. I know that I told you guys about it. My psychiatrist or psychologist has diagnosed me with having unhealthy levels of disassociation. I'm talking to some people from my past and present now who have witnessed it firsthand because I have no recollection of the shit. And I remember getting into heated arguments over it, too. Part of disassociation, right? <laughs> right. You know? um, I think you put it in the chat, say that it's like their personality is like faded out because it's been bleached. Yeah, it's because their brain just got bleached. And I can say yeah, that for a second. When... So I want to have an episode with that. I'm just trying to pull everyone together because I never actually delved into it from the perspective of I accept that I have this issue and I need to get to know it better so maybe I can address it better. That's, I mean, my, my hat's off to you for that because you are willingly facing what could be uh, painful, embarrassing, you know, uh, well, uh, situations where you went through. Um, and I've gone through it with Sarah where she's like, do you remember last night after I've been drinking? And I'm literally like, I don't, and I don't want to because I already feel ashamed. Um, you know? Uh, and so going going into that, you know, yeah, it's, it's brave, especially publicly, man. Like, it's doing it publicly. Um, yeah, I, I, well, my whole thing has always been i'm never going to ask anybody to do on this podcast what i'm not willing to do myself and because i run a podcast and i want it to succeed it's it's almost kind of almost kind of shitty but at the same time it's kind of a good thing i guess that every time i start having a deep conversation about mental health i'm almost always going to go we should put it on the podcast we should put it on the podcast i almost want to ask everybody hey you know what this is a great conversation will you be a guest well, this here's another one of those things. This is something that it terrifies me. There's a major part of me that does not want to have these conversations at all. But it has hurt my relationships. It has hurt me. It has hurt people around me. And it's something I can't remember. Yeah. And that terrifies me. But I can't get any better if I don't address it. Yeah. My, therapist, Only, like, my, my therapist thinks I'm nuts to try to do it <laughs> on air. But I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to have a discussion beforehand. You know, I want to know a little bit yeah. more before. I'm not doing the let's just peel off the band aid in front of the world. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, even just just approaching the subject period like shows your dedication to your growth, which is which is amazing. Um. That, like, I used to think the scariest question that you can ask somebody um, is, what's your perception of me? Right? Because um, you're, you're, you're opening yourself up to a world of hurt and disappointment. Um, that's now been trumped, <laughs> right, um, with, with, with what you're willing to go into here. And then Dink just joined in. Late as usual, it's like, yeah, we're about to end the episode. Perfect timing. <laughs> but Sarah did say the thing that, yeah, it's the root cause as to why I'm, I'm doing this. Yeah. Not being able to trust your own mind is one of the scariest things in life. Yeah. It's also why I've gotten really big on philosophy. 
everything you do is is dictated by your own philosophy. And if you do something that you don't know why you did it, it's because there's something in your philosophy, I believe, that's inconsistent with the rest of your philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah well, disassociation is uh, often a defense mechanism, right? So it's it, there's a lot to dive, to dive into there. Uh, from my limited experiences with it, and, and we talked about it earlier, you know, in, in our group chat, um, where I, I don't have personal experience with, with it, but I've witnessed it. Um, and what I learned from that person is that uh, there would be something would trigger them to, um, to disassociate, right? So understanding both what the triggers are that cause you to do it and then how you act once you're disassociated may give you a better understanding of um, of the whole situation so that you can work towards you know uh, better mental health so you could possibly be armed to deal with that situation that may have triggered it in the past and not have it trigger in the future because you're better prepared for it. Yeah. And then David also said, a step forward is a step forward. No matter how many times you step back, as long as you keep moving forward, no matter how small, it's a step forward. For sure. And I, refl- for sure. And I responded back to him, something I've said before. You know, It was because of Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, there was a line so profound that it has been, it has become part of my personal philosophy, which is, you pass your demons on to your children, and that's why mm-hmm. I'm hell bent to beat this thing. This is why I'm hell bent mm-hmm. to beat so many of my issues. It's why mm-hmm. I called my dad up at the age of thirty seven, thirty eight, bawling my eyes out, trying to wrestle with what he told me back when I was in like second or third grade, because that haunted me for so long and I did not want to do something similar to my kids leave something that haunted them into their 30s yeah. and who's to say that they're going to have the strength to call me to face me yeah I mean and for something to last that long that must have impacted virtually every aspect of your life it did you know that it's you know I have I still ha- I'm still dealing with the after effects of it, but there was this issue of me feeling that I had to get approval of everybody around me, and I would do almost anything for that approval. And that came from, even though I knew it was a lie at the time, I was I had enough knowledge to know that it was not true, but it still, still traumatized me. My dad said to me, "I get along." fine with your sister and I get along fine with your mother. What's wrong with you that I can't get along with you? I was in grade mm-hmm. school. My dad mm-hmm. had no recollection of saying it, but we did work through it. I know where he, I, I, we figured out where that came from. Um, yeah. Addiction. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, like my, so I told you about like the, 28 pages I wrote earlier. Yeah. Um, part of that came from the night that I learned my parents got divorced. Something my dad told me that fucked me up for years and years and years. That was, uh, I mean, was, honestly, that was so fucked up. Like, seriously, that's hearing your story pisses me off to the, even now, I've heard that story like four times. We, 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 during that day, we had a really meaningful conversation. And he's like, you know, you're a really good kid. You're really caring, and I love you a lot. Um, you know, but and he was trying. His intention was he was trying to make life easier on my mom after he's gone. I didn't know he'd be leaving. You know, he's like, you know, you just you need to listen more. You don't listen. You need to listen when your mom tells you things. Um, you know, you you so- make things hard on your mom. You, you know, and you make things hard on everybody around you. And it's, you know, 
uh, and it's a problem, and you need to work on it. Okay, so promise me you're, you're going to work on it. Basically, he was trying to I impart his final left. words of wisdom. I thought he left because I was a bad kid. Because I didn't listen. But he was taking the adult approach, speaking to somebody that doesn't have an adult mentality at that point. There you go. Right. So I had huge abandonment issues. Uh, I had huge abandonment issues up until maybe even through my first marriage. Like it's, uh, I will, Sarah's got on to me about this. She's heard, heard me talk about it. Like I've stayed in bad relationships uh, just because it was the devil I knew. And I felt like, oh, I'm paying penance for something I've done. I deserve this. Heaven's right? reward, mental fallacy, or a cognitive distortion. <laughs> We talked about right. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. But yeah, that's um, exactly what that is. If I, if, I, uh, if I go through enough punishment, I get my reward. Where in life does it say that that's the way it works? I, so, yeah. I mean, I don't even know if I, if I was looking for a mental reward. Like, like we were talking about morals earlier and Sarah and how I said Sarah – says that I set my I set such a, a moral standard for myself I set myself up to fail uh, and that's that's one of them you know um, I I'm going through this not because there's something positive on the outcome but I'm going through this because I've earned it I am so hardcore about owning my shit like 100 percent own own what I've done and I saw problems with this like I'll, I'll make excuses from time to time um, well, I mean, and, you're human. But, yeah, but I, and I, sometimes I, I pick the wrong fucking shit to try to own, you know, to all the way to hell in a handbasket, but, um, and it, and I, I'm very big on ownership, and it's something I've told a lot of people where, about ownership and to kind of give some perspective on it. Like, when we do something good, we're like, hey, look at me, I did this great thing, pat me on the back, give me a high five, let's celebrate my success. But when we fail, sometimes we go, well, it's not my fault. The sun was in my eyes. I had hay fever. Uh, it was mercury, you know. Uh, you know uh, mercury was in the wrong house. Re- yeah. Re- <laughs> it was mercury retrograde. Um, you know, my, my cat had diarrhea, and therefore that's why, you know, I cheated on my wife. Um, whatever dumb shit people want to come up with, right? Um uh, I will right. say this right now. David saw me at my worst when I was doing that shit. At my absolute worst. And David's one of those guys, he calls it out. Yeah. Gives no fucks, calls it out. And I was not prepared to hear it, and I pulled away. And I'm yeah. so thankful that day, that he's still in my life to this day. I appreciate that kind of bluntness so much. Took me a while to learn how to appreciate it, but I appreciate it. I don't like uh, I don't like friends that sugarcoat things. Just fucking tell me. Radical honesty is that what they call it? I, I want to say people call it. I think it's radical honesty. I'm looking that up. Um, where it is, um, because brutal honesty has a negative connotation, like you're trying to tear somebody down. But radical honesty is. Here are the facts. I'm not going to candy coat them. I'm not going to judge you. Well, here you go. But, Radical honesty is the practice of complete honesty without telling even white lies. The phrase was trademarked in 1997 as a technique and self-improvement program based on the 1996 best-selling book Radical Honesty by Brad Brad, uh, Brad Blanton or Blanton Blanton. Yeah, I don't, I don't think society is ready for radical honesty, but you can have a radically honest conversation. Egos are way too fragile for radical honesty. Um, it's a it's a conversation we had in our house. Uh, Sarah cooks ninety nine point nine 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 percent of our meals. She's an amazing amazing chef. Um, and instead of telling her, uh, I, I told a story about one of my exes that was very proud of a dish she would make, and I hated it. It was. It was foul. It was a uh, an assault on my taste buds. But I ate it with a smile because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. 
uh, which made her want to make it more often. And that's my own fault. Um, so what we do in our house is um, the phrase is, it's not my favorite. And that means, um, please never make this again. <laughs> right. So there's a lentil dinner that my wife made once. That That is right there. But at the same time, it's not her favorite either. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The only thing that ever, I've ever said that uh, uh, was with uh, Sarah felt the same way. <laughs> uh, it wasn't one of her. It wasn't one of her things. She was experimenting and experimenting. Got a lot going on in the chat here. What have we been missing? Uh, there was, we were talking a little bit about the radical honesty and. David and I were just having a moment together in the chat, you know, talking about how he's still here. And I told him I could never put into words how much I appreciate that he's still here, but I'll happily spend the rest of my life being appreciative and letting him know. You know that the power of appreciation, you know, the, it's not even like vast acts. It is just, just, a uh, um, a murmuring of a thank you sometimes can really change somebody's day, you know? Um, and not just for that person, but when we learn to be appreciative, it's such a positive force in us that um, it increases our well being as well. Because a lot of us, when we're in dark places, we're not really appreciative. No. Um, it's hard to be appreciative you know? when you're in a dark place. Absolutely. You're very dismissive of things that you should, that, well, that I, I would say should, but, you know, we've already had that discussion about you. Sh- yeah. Don't should all over yourself. But, yeah, no, it's things that you normally would be appreciative, but when you're in that dark place, it doesn't matter. You you minimize it, and you maximize yeah. your own suffering. Yeah. Yeah, like David said, it feels nice to be nice. It is. Like, um, one of the most fulfilling things that I, that uh, I've had long-term in my life is when I decided to do my best to live uh, by my credo, which is do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Don't do the right thing because you're looking for the pat on the back. Don't do the right thing because you will get recognition or it'll get you fame and success. Do it because it's the right thing to do. And often the right thing to do is to show kindness. Yeah. Uh, and the goal is not to feel good for being kind, but it's definitely a byproduct. You know? Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with appreciating that byproduct as long as your intentions are true. So easy to get addicted to the byproduct. Yep. And then you're doing yeah. the right then you're doing what you think's the right thing because the pat on the back is dealt that that leads to dark places. I'm, I'm actually really uncomfortable with compliments. I don't like I, I. I'm sure I like I get them as much as the next person, but when I, I like I, because I don't do things for compliments. Now I'm not saying that I don't appreciate the compliments. I do, and in that embarrassment, like uh, I'm, there's some joy in there. Um, however. Um, like, I just, I find it hard. Uh, and I think part of it is because I don't feel like it's deserving. Um, and not because I'm not worthy, but because it's not why I did something that may, may, uh, may have gotten a compliment. Like going back to my weightlifting, if I, if I hit a PR, I'm like lifting 500 pounds and I'm getting high fives and compliments. Fuck yeah, celebrate me. That's the shit right there. Right. You know? Uh, but if, uh, somebody's broke down in the middle of an intersection, which I've done like riding my motorcycle or well, when I had one riding my buddy's motorcycle now, cause he lent it to me long term. Uh, I've come across somebody who's out of gas and broke down. I don't know what the hell's wrong with their car, but, uh, at a red light and like, they're freaking out in the passenger seat and hop off the bike, run up. Like, are you okay? You want me to push you across the street? And you're like, Oh, can you? And it's like this little itty bitty person. We couldn't push your car himself. Right. He parked my bike really quick. I'll be right back. Park the bike and then push it. And it's kindness. People witness, witnessing kindness is amazing. It is, it is so contagious because I start pushing the car. 
Next in the blink you know. of an eye, two more people are there beside me from two different cars, uh, you know, and everybody's helping this one person. And all it takes is that one person to start it. Yeah. And they're like, you're, you know, and the person's like, you know, you're, you're such an awesome person. Thank you so much. You're so kind. And I'm like, no, no, don't like that made me feel really uncomfortable. No, I'm just doing the right thing. Like you're stuck. (laughs) Well, I watched, uh, so, uh, it was June. You know how hot it gets in June around here. Yeah. Let's not talk about heat. Good Lord, what we just went through. I was, oh my God, that that was a hellish heat wave. But I was going to go pick up one of my kids. This is a few years back, you know, junior high or high school. And I witnessed this car just all of a sudden look like they, they were getting ready to take a left-hand turn. And, you know, I was facing them approaching the intersection and they started making their turn. And it's like they lost control of the car, did a 180 degree turn, and went into a ditch. I immediately found a place to pull over after I crossed the intersection. So I was on the same same stretch of road that they were on, pulled over. I didn't even get out of my car, and there was already someone else there. Um, it was an elderly woman who, unfortunately, because of the heat, got dehydrated. And when you get dehydrated, especially when you're oh, elderly... Yeah you lose a lot of your cognitive capabilities. Yep. They Absolutely. didn't even know who they were. And it's like, I went to the passenger seat. Their purse had just exploded all over the floorboard and all that. And I got all their stuff together and made sure it was all accounted for. Made sure that the person that came over to help was witnessing, look, I'm not taking shit. I'm putting it all away. Right. Yeah. Be yeah, kind, but be smart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and the thing is, the person that came to help if you went based off of stereotypes, you never would have expected this person's help. Tatted up, big old gauge earrings, you know, pierced tongue, piercings everywhere. Uh, wearing some pretty goth-tastic clothes. Yeah. Kindest person I think I've met in, the, in that whole year. Yeah. The, never uh, judge a book by its cover. So the, the person that I helped push their car... Um, it was, they, they made a joke about my shirt because I was wearing one of my assholes blue forever shirts. <laughs> and, she, you know, and she was basically like, that's false advertising. I'm like, I didn't say I live forever. I just said assholes live forever. You know? But, <laughs> um, so, yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm an asshole. Oh, I'm an asshole. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm, I'm the asshole you want on your side, though. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm a deeply caring person that has an asshole to protect myself. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of have to modern times. Yep. Probably for all time. Anyway. Uh, let's see here. Dink. Sense of love. Uh, we are the special kind of people in the world. The ones who are giving and helpful without receiving anything back. Yeah. But pay it forward. That movie. Every, like, every time I, I do, ever since I've seen that movie, when I help strangers... You know, um, I've helped people out at gas stations. Like, do you have an address? I'll, I'll send you money back. Just pay it for it when yeah. you're able to. Exactly. You know, I'm the same people way. Who are, people who are paying handling. I still haven't uh, even like seen that movie. Change. I haven't seen that movie, but I, I've i been paying it for it my whole life. Yeah, do it. Like, it, it's it's an amazing movie. Um, like, giving uh, um, somebody's panhandling, like, 20 bucks. You know, so they can actually go get something to eat that they want to enjoy. Uh, a beer I, or two if they want. I don't care. Um, okay, so I'm, there was a guy that I used that that I worked with on the CPU team. He may have been on one of your teams. Um, I'm not going to drop a name, but I'll say that part of a Stockton motorcycle club. Um, glasses, short hair, tall, funny. Best salesperson on a team ever. This dude could sell everything. Um, he's yeah, the same kind of guy. He was all uh, one time he went out, you know, got himself a case of beer um, at a liquor store, and there was a guy that was begging. And the guy's like, Hey, you got any spare change? He's like, What? Are you going to have it for alcohol? The guy's like, uh, No. He's like, Here, just have one of my beers. It's a Friday. You deserve a drink too sometimes. He was like, yeah. Really? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah. He's like, you're going to spend it on the beer anyway, right? He's like, yeah, actually, I was. He's like, oh, here you go. Mm-hmm. You, don't need, you don't even have to go into the store. Here you go. <laughs> have a good day. There you go. Yeah, I learned 
I learned a lot about um, um, panhandling. Did you have something to say, C? I thought you were like, you had to hand up or something. No? Okay. No. Uh, yeah. I learned a lot about panhandling and hanging out with my dad when he was homeless. Uh, I go downtown San Francisco and hang out with him and his, his homeless friends. Uh, and they, like salt to earth, the earth, best people on the planet. Some people are like, my dad was, was homeless. He told me he was homeless because he wanted to be homeless. He's like, uh, he's like, you think you're free. You have your job, you pay your rent, you know, you pay your car note, uh, you pay your bills every month. You got to answer to a boss. He's like, I get up when I want, go to bed when I want, I get high if I want, you know, I hang out with friends whenever I want, you know, which one of us is actually free? And I was like, damn, pops. Yeah. All well, right. There's, there's... I was like, I can't argue with you. <laughs> like... There are people, This was, I read about this, again, this is like in the early 2000s that there was a homeless camp up in Seattle where the people, their tents, they had like home sweet home signs and welcome mats and all that. They chose that that's how they want to live because not only can panhandling, can, you can do pretty well with it if you know what you're doing. They were also getting a made $350 a day in the 90s panhandling. Would eat, would eat $15 in fast food and smoke the rest. Yeah, but there's... Um, at the same time, the city was also paying homeless people to help them out, you know, and with the goal of maybe if we help them out, they'll want to get off the streets. Now, you know what you did? You enabled them. 100 percent. That's what I said. And you know what? I at least if that's the way, money. if that's the way they want to live, <laughs> that's the way they want to live. Who, yep. who am I to judge on that? Like you said, yeah. that person was free. And who are who are we to tell anybody how they should live, period? You know? Live your best life. It, like the way I judge success is, is li- being able to afford the life, doing what you enjoy, and being able to afford the life you want to, with as little struggle as possible, so that you have you know easily found happiness. That that's success. And for my pop, that was he was in his own right. He would never think a homeless person successful, but he was living his life exactly how he wanted to. Without regret and without apology, um, and he's on right. You know, he found his version of success. And then Dink just dropped in. Uh, I helped out a homeless guy with a dog around here who was amazing. He doesn't ask for anything. People give him things all the time. All he says is, "I just want a job." Mm-hmm. Now, why I started paying it forward was because of one of my uncles, my uncle Rusty. Anybody that knows me knows how much I love this man. And how much of an impact he had on my life. He was talking about he was working for Caltrans, clearing, you know, roads, uh, you know, the roadsides and the shoulders. And every day he would go to this Circle K and there was this homeless guy. Every day, my uncle bought him a coffee and a donut. You know, he walked in, bought it, came out, handed it to him. Did this every day for two months. And then one day the guy was just gone. Four months later, the guy shows up and in... Nice car, nice suit, all nice and clean. And he wanted to give my uncle a hundred bucks to pay him back for what he did. And my uncle just flat out said, no, find the next person just like you that had a hard, hard start. Give him a little something to get going every day. That's all you need to yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. A little, kindness. A little extra kindness. Spring, a little bit of kindness springs hope. Yeah. Know. Hope is powerful. Springs hope like weeds, but the kind that you want. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for the new listeners coming in. Welcome to the family. Uh, AmIMental.net, that is our official homepage. Uh, We have links to our different social media stuff. Uh, Please join us in Discord. We can continue this conversation. Discord is forever, so that way if you drop something like at 3 in the morning, it'll get responded to eventually. (laughs) Um, We have art stuff, uh, our art um, channel. I actually have been writing music again. Austin C and Bexy yeah. and Jay got pretty to be epic here. stuff too. Yeah, but I really got to rework yeah. out those lyrics. But you're right, the cadence is garbage. <laughs> it is absolute trash. I can't stand hearing it. <laughs> no, those were not my words. 
No, I know they yeah, weren't your words. I did I'm not s- tell him he's Larry for garbage. No, you 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 made a very <laughs> your critiquing was spot on. It was absolutely spot on. I think they're garbage. The lyrics themselves, I think, are good. The cadence was yeah. garbage. So yeah, I plan on staying up until I'm groggy, and then redoing the lyrics after tomorrow night go. because it's the weekend, and I'm more creative when I'm groggy. Yep. Yep. Just a little bit of working inflection. A little bit, of, a little bit in, in, in cadence. Yep, and I'm going to actually mm-hmm. drop the instrumental version of that song uh, tonight into the art channel, just as a little tease. I'm downloading it because that is straight fire. I heard that. Uh, I heard like the first three, you know, the first three notes in it. I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, let's go, let's go. Yeah, Dave. Was- Dave had this one song. Okay, so I wrote this one song called Overdose. He requested that one while I was at w- working right next to him all the time. Great song, by the way. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, Dick's asking where. So, yeah, if you go to amimental.net, uh, you know what? I'm going to pull it up right now just to make sure I'm giving you accurate descri- de- instructions. If you go to amimental.net, at the top right-hand corner, yep. you'll see an icon for Discord. Yep. If you don't know what Discord is, it looks like a controller or a little like a little helmet with eyes or, or a, a Space Invader alien. That's what I thought, Space Invader, yeah. Yeah, when you click on that, it'll just take you right in and ask you to go ahead and, you know, if you have an account, just accept the invitation yeah. and you're in. Yeah, Discord is basically... Uh, it's a message a, board. A social, me- a social media chat messaging board. And also has voice um, channels. Yep. And uh, for most Discords, you need some sort of invite. This link is your invite. <laughs> Damn it, Bo. <laughs> okay, inside jokes are being shared inside the chat. Yeah, you, 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 you had to be there. And see, you had your hand up. What's up? I didn't have my hand up. You did. Unless you were just waving. <laughs> I'm getting pwned by oh. <laughs> stupid are you a robot thing. It's like match this picture and it's none of the pictures. Going to connect that. Stop asking. All right, so let's go ahead and do this here. We'll catch you guys next week. Until then, I'm E. Moss. I'm C. And we'll all see you later.